What exactly is a spokes cow? Our next guest will explain. Tell me, boy, you make me so bored. You need to walk the other way. I tell you once more. Welcome back to Women Leading in Cannabis, where we go deep and get real with pioneering women shaping today's cannabis industry. You can find us on the PodConnects Network on iTunes, Spotify, and Pandora. If you like what you hear, subscribe to Women Leading in Cannabis. I'm your host, Kira Reed. I'm here today with Ola Lassard, Chief Marketing Officer for Hemp Fusion Wellness. Welcome to the show, Ola. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Prior to working in hemp, Ola spent 15 years as a strategic marketing and PR consultant to brands like Stonyfield Organic Yogurt, Brown Cow, and Late July Organic Chips, and as VP of Marketing for the highly respected natural products company, Berlin's. Ola is the current president of the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, the hemp industry's leading industry advocacy and lobbying organization. She is the first woman to serve in that role and the only person to be voted into a second term. The roundtable aims to advance hemp regulations and diversity in the industry and provide a clear legal pathway for high quality, safe hemp products across the U.S. All right, Ola, you have to start by explaining to our audience what is a spokes cow and how you went from that to CMO of a hemp company. (laughs) Well, yeah, so Brown Cow Yogurt is a very beloved brand, and their spokesperson is a cow called Lily. Um, And I guess I would just say that this is probably the most fun gig I ever had in my entire life. So she's this, like, diva-esque, sort of sassy, not as smart as she thinks she is kind of personality. So it was a lot of fun to sort of... um, you know, sort of represent the company through this voice of this, this diva cow, Lily. And, um, but yeah, so that was just, is a very brand loyal company. Um, Brown cow people sort of are very passionate about it. And so we just got to have a lot of fun with it. So it was one of, one of those little, one of those little gigs that I picked up along the way that I just had a ball with. So, and how I went from there to being a CMO of a, of a hemp company, boy, that's a, it's a circuitous route as most people in marketing have, um, really just, you know, was in that organic foods space for quite a while. Honestly, from a personal level, kind of got to the point, my husband and I sat down and we were like, what do we want the next chapter of our lives to be? Our kids were getting a little older. They were kind of past the, you know, tricycle and the cul-de-sac stage and moving on to the teen stage. And we thought, what do, where do we want to be? Like, where do we want to live? What kind of community do we want to be in? And so we actually did this sort of soul searching where we decided like, you know, I love art and he loves music and we both love the outdoors. So we actually sort of looked at what kind of community do we want to be in for this next phase? And um, it was just one of those weird things that, you know, just as we sort of came to the conclusion that we knew what we wanted for the next phase, I got a call from a recruiter for Barleen's and, you know, next thing we knew we were packing up our house and moving 3000 miles across the country for a new adventure. And so that was a really cool step. And and from there, I met Jason Mitchell, the founder and CEO of Hemp Fusion Wellness. And here I am today. So I don't know. I think most people in marketing have a story like this. You know, it's like we sort of find our little wiggly path. My husband's in medicine, so it's a very straight line for those guys. This is the job you have. This is the title you have. And he looks at my resume and he's like, wait, you did training and you did this and you just, you know, that's how we are, I guess, right? Communicators. Yeah. Yeah. We wear a lot of hats and take on a lot of projects. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about the U.S. Hemp Roundtable. What does it do? Who is part of it and who should join it? Yeah, that's a great question. So what it does, I mean, there are a number of hemp organizations and there's some really fantastic ones. Um, The U.S. Hemp Roundtable really is, as you said at the beginning, the leading sort of business advocacy group for the industry. So we're the folks that are behind a lot of the sort of lobbying on behalf of the hemp industry working with legislators on the state level, working with legislators on the federal level, 
trying to help inform and craft some of the the legislative fixes that we need because as you know anybody in this space whether it's on the sort of marijuana side of cannabis or on the hemp side of cannabis you know there's just this patchwork of of regulation and missing holes and things that make it hard to do business and so on the hemp side um, the u.s hemp roundtable really is there trying to push for sensible and clean and clear legislation that allows for safe effective products um, to be able to be brought to market and, and to be successful. So that's really what we want. I mean, we're sort of, we hold ourselves to a high standard and we hold the industry to a high standard, but you know, our, our goal is very clear. You know, there are all of these people that can benefit from this, this industry being allowed to, to prosper. And we want to do it in a way that's smart and safe for people, but that allows businesses and farmers and everybody along the chain to, to be able to be part of this really exciting industry. So you went from a career in food to a career in hemp. As a woman, are there differences in the way you were treated, respected, opportunities for your career advancement, et cetera? Are there big differences between these two industries for you? You know, I do get asked that question a lot. And I think, I think there are differences in the industries. Let me start there and just say that, you know, in food, I think there is a, there are a lot more women. There's a lot more representation of diversity as a whole. Um, in sort of, you know, in the food space and probably even in the organic food space. Hemp, you know, certainly when I first entered this space, which was, you know, I guess six years ago now, I mean, when I went to my first board meeting and I first joined the the board of the U.S. Hemp Roundtable on behalf of Barleen's. So, and and for those that aren't familiar with Barleen's, they are, you know, a 31 or two year old family owned company. They're really a healthy oils company. They started as a flax oil company. They're very well known for fish and flax and borage oil. And um, so they were the first major sort of non-cannabis company to enter enter the CBD space. None of the big boys had kind of jumped in to that space yet. And Barleen's was really took that chance first before any other large company. So that was kind of an interesting and exciting thing. And what was interesting about that um, was that because so many of the companies in the hemp and CBD space had, you know, they had all basically emerged from, you know, either being straight up hemp cannabis or sort of, you know, marijuana set of cannabis, but they they came up as cannabis companies. And now you had the first big supplement company that was very well known and also extremely highly respected stepped into the space. So we were really open, uh, welcomed with super open arms. And that's kind of unusual when you have a industry that's been built by small businesses, they're not usually real stoked to see a big big company jump in. Um, But that was actually the opposite of what the reaction we had. I think it's because the space was so unsettled and there was so much uncertainty and there was skepticism by store, you know, retailers and legislators and everybody to have a very well-known and very highly respected brand like Barleen's enter actually kind of, you know, everyone was like, we're, we were wondering who would jump in first. And we're really glad it's you guys, because I think there was that automatic elevation of like, oh, if Barleen's is doing it, it, it must be okay kind of thing. So there was an interesting and very unusual reaction just because of where I was when I entered the space. Um, I will also say, so we at Barleen's at that time joined the U.S. Hemp Roundtable as a, as a board member. And so when I went to those meetings, I think, again, although the industry was very white and male, it just happens that the general counsel, Jonathan Miller, who is really the sort of beating heart behind the U.S. Hemp Roundtable largely, he is very much a person who believes and champions diversity. So, I mean, it was almost funny, you know, like he was giddy that there was finally a woman. I mean, I think there may have been one other woman sitting around the table in those, those meetings, but I mean, it was just, they were actually really excited to have a woman because it was something they understood was wrong (laughs) with the industry. Um, And subsequent to that, you know, it's been a big push of this organization to also, you know, bring in more diversity across the spectrum. I mean, Hemp in particular was built on the backs, frankly, of slaves in this country. And it was very prosperous in the early part of our country for white landowners. And so we as an organization have really looked at that and thought, this umbrella needs to be inclusive. It's really, really important to us that this umbrella is inclusive and that we are part of the the solution. My husband has a saying he loves to say to my kids, which is, you know, that whole, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I think we take that very much to heart with the U.S. Hemp Roundtable that we have an opportunity to widen the tent. Um, and that's something we're really trying to do. So I think the industry may not have been super inclusive to women, but I just happen to be in two places that I didn't personally experience anything but actually people being excited to see me at the table. So 
I know that that's not been the case for women entering the space totally in general, but that was kind of my personal experience was actually really positive. Well, that's good to hear. I mean, not, you know, yeah. so, okay. So let's dig into um, the social justice and advocacy piece you were alluding to earlier. So we know that marijuana advocacy includes things like patient access and social justice. Where is hemp when it comes to these issues? I mean, it's interesting because my original question was, you know, pointed at the fact that no one was going to jail risking selling hemp, you know, 10 years ago. Um, but what you just said about it being built on the backs of slaves, that is not something I've heard in the conversation. So can you talk to me a little bit more about that? And what does the hemp industry plan to do? What are, what are, what is your vision on inclusivity and equitable distribution of opportunity because you straddle not just cannabis, but also agriculture because you are, you know, hemp is much more accepted in the ag world than THC and marijuana. So can you just kind of talk about all of those things together and how hemp is really, what the perspective is on the history and where it's going today when it comes to social equity and, uh, advocacy and equity and inclusion? Yeah, sure. I mean, so it's a great question. And, and so, you know, I, I think what's really interesting is, you know, in the very early days of our nation, hemp was a major, major crop, uh, you know, in many places across the country. And in fact, there were apparently states that required farmers to grow hemp. I mean, it was such an important crop to the, to the United States. So, you know, but again, I, I mean, a lot of our founding farmers grew hemp um, and they also owned slaves who farmed that hemp for them. And, uh, you know, and that was quite common, unfortunately. And, you know, part of the history of this crop, we also know that hemp got kind of pulled in to, you know, the sort of absurdity of what happened around marijuana, which was very racially motivated. And so, you know, that's when we saw hemp disappear. It was like, you know, it was sort of lumped in with marijuana and a lot of the drive behind, you know, making marijuana and cannabis in general illegal, you know, historically does appear to be very racially motivated. So, you know, I think that that, that all kind of comes in. So that, you know, then you have now an emerging industry, both for marijuana, but let's just talk about hemp. So hemp, obviously, from like the supplement side and the oils and all this. So we know that this is a crop that, you know, the farm bill made it very clear what we could, you know, come back to this. It was, it was not a Schedule One drug. You know, it was taken out of the Controlled Substances Act, all of that good stuff that that, that earlier farm bill did. But... I think because CBD was the sort of first big economic opportunity within hemp, and I don't think it's by any means the last. So I work with a company, I, we own three CBD brands actually, Hemp Fusion, Sage of the Natural, and Apothecana. But the reality is there's so much more to hemp than CBD. And I think, you know, we're behind in terms of building, you know, materials and all sorts of other things, but we'll get there. Um, but I think because this big first economic, you know, opportunity was around CBD and you had this whole confusion about CBD as a supplement and how it fell into the FDA's regulations um, because we had a drug first and all this stuff and uh, you know we don't have to get super technical about that but there was then this weird stall right where like farmers were growing stuff but then they couldn't sell it and the industry was poised to be you know this 22 billion dollar industry but then it couldn't happen because the FDA didn't act so there are all these things that were kind of happening around CBD but the reality is you know, most of the CBD companies that are, are that are operating today are not very diverse. You know, they are largely still started because by people who generally tend to have more access to capital and sort of business education, which is is not minorities in this country. So I think that's where we see this inequity piece where we're hoping to be able to step into. So it's, you know, the ability to access capital is important for anyone who's trying to, you know, create business opportunity, right? So there's there's that piece. And there's also just sort of the historical sort of systemic lack of knowledge. If you haven't had sort of the, the benefit of those generations of, of business people around you, then it's just harder to know how do you compete? I mean, there are over 3,500 different CBD companies. You know, how do you compete if you're not quite sure, you know, and don't necessarily have access to the money to hire the you know experts to tell you. So how do you as a small business person try to emerge? And most of these companies are small businesses. Just the information, you know, how to source things, what CGMP manufacturing is all about, you know, how to label products pr appropriately, 
all the things that can knock you down in the supplements world are things that we see as, as barriers to entry to this industry. So the Roundtable has held, um, partnered with the Minority Business Cannabis Association um, and put on you know, um, sort of educational webcasts, you know, during COVID, so we can't get together in person, but it's worked really well with in terms of doing webinars and, you know, interactive webinars to sort of provide experts in the industry to come in and, and just talk about, hey, here's how, you, you know, here's what you need to think about labeling. Here's, you know, manufacturing things you need to be aware of. Here's some of the, the law, legislative and, and legal things you need to think about from a state by state basis, as well as the federal government. So we're trying to at least take the experts that we have in our organization and bring them to the group to say like, we can help provide some basic education to folks that want to enter this space and also try to help push, you know, where we can just sort of, because we're, you know, in a connected organization, if you will, to try to look at some of the other social justice things. So, I mean, for us, a lot of it is education, access to knowledge that allows people to potentially enter the space. We're also, of course, you know, pushing hard to try to get the Safe Banking Act passed um, which will make a huge difference for all business owners, small to large, in terms of ability to do business in this space. So there are just a number of things like that, but I think just making sure people have access to people who can help them, you know, so and, and give them the information about how to run this kind of business because it's it's tricky. It's unlike any other, you know, industry that exists right now, I think. Mm-hmm. So what role do you see hemp playing in some of our biggest issues today? I mean, obviously, we talk a lot about climate change and the impact that hemp can have there. Are there other areas of issues that we face today as a country, as a world, that we should be supporting in in the possibility of hemp as our future? Yeah, I think that's a great question, too. And, and you know, if I can kind of harken back to my days with working with Stonyfield Organic Yogurt, I, I, I worked with them very extensively. And they are, of course, huge proponent of family farms. And so in that role, I learned an awful lot about the plight of family farmers in the U.S. and around the world, but, you know, specifically in the U.S. when it came to their products. And, you know, family farms are going under just, you know, every minute practically in this country. And it, and it's, it's a loss. It's a loss to a way of life, but it's, it's a loss to important resources. And I, and I think also just the sort of prevalence of, you know, toxic pesticides and herbicides that are used in so many crops in the U S um, farmers have astronomically high cancer rate. I mean, you're just exposing people to dangerous chemicals and it's hard work and it's always a struggle to get paid. Right. So I think whenever you, and that's where sort of organic milk, you know, farmers can make a living wage selling organic milk versus regular milk. And oh, by the way, you know, not have to, you know, inject their cows with all sorts of crazy stuff. And it's the same for crops. So if you can provide a crop like hemp that does not require so many of those chemicals and also has high demand, you're going to keep farmers alive. And you're also going to have a generation that's coming up that's going to maybe consider you know, keeping the family farm and, and getting it going. And I think, you know, hemp has also, you know, a little bit of a like, a, oh, that's a, it's an interesting new product. So younger people are a little bit more interested, you know, than in growing that maybe than, you know, soybeans or whatever, some of the other crops that are kind of more mainstream. So I think there's a huge farming support opportunity here. I really, really do. And that's, that's actually just really important to the infrastructure of our country as a whole. So that is a major piece. I think it's a safer crop. And I think it, again, if we can kind of get the FDA to act, and this is one of the big pushes for us is until there's clarity around CBD being legal as a supplement, this industry does not fully exist. No major retailer is taking in CBD supplements until the FDA makes it very clear that they're okay. And that's just, that's our big push right now is without that, there are just so many places along the supply chains and the biggest one is farmers that are getting hit and sort of are on this weird hold until we get action from the FDA. So I think that's another big area. It's just, there's, there's a huge economic piece that we could use that comes from farmers to processors to, you know, just a number of industries where that have been hurting for a long time. We have the ability to have a really big emerging business um, and industry industry that, but we won't have that until the FDA takes action. Let's, well, let's talk about legalization, right? Because it's kind of moving in that direction. So there's, on the one hand, the issue with the FDA. We saw what not having um, access to those supplements and clearance on, you know, consuming CBD. 
or even extracting it here. Crazy that you could extract uh, THC, but not CBD in California a couple of years ago. Where, how is legalization going to impact hemp? So you mentioned safe banking. Are there other areas that will be impacted when at a federal level, cannabis is no longer illegal? THC is no longer illegal. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see because as you said, we've seen on state level sometimes you know, THC being legal more than hemp. So on the one hand, sort of hemp has has purposefully tried to keep distance from, you know, because there was so much confusion initially, um, you know, like is CBD pot? Is it, you know, I mean, just, and for people who weren't looking for marijuana, you know, we as an industry had to make it very clear, like this is, you know, this is a different, it's a different component within the plant, it, you know, non-intoxicating versus intoxicating, all of that stuff. So, you know, in in the very action of, trying to establish that difference now you know some of the consequences are are coming back around where sometimes it's tricky because the marijuana lobby in a, in a given state might be stronger than the hemp lobby so sometimes we're seeing you know thc move forward faster than hemp um or you know cbd so it's it's tricky but i i think that once we as a country get to the point where we just legalize cannabis period I think it'll all kind of come along fairly well. I don't think it solves the CBD problem though. And so that is just, again, I, I think until we can solve the problem of supplements, which is nothing to do with intoxication, it's it has to just do with the fact that, that the FDA, you know, ha- has this, this, the drug application sort of legislation and, and hasn't found a way to make it clear that CBD is still okay. I don't, I don't know that hemp moves forward very quickly until we do that, you know, unless we just catch up in other areas of hemp, like building products, you know, there's hempcrete and all sorts of stuff and Europe's just way ahead of us in this stuff. So if that catches up, then that'll be a whole other piece of the industry that moves forward. But um, I don't see hemp right now with where we are. I think it's hinging on CBD and I think we're not going to be able to you know, give farmers the assurance that they should grow those crops again when they had to throw a lot of them out a few years ago. I mean, that's just, it's too big a risk. So I, I think until we clarify the issue around supplements and and what's allowed and larger retailers, therefore, will start to sell CBD, which their consumers want, but, you know, large companies are risk averse. And so you, every health food store carries CBD products, but you're not going to find it in a very large retailer typically in a, in a supplement form. Do you think there is a drawback to federal legalization? I don't. I, I mean, I, maybe that's just me speaking personally. <laughs> um, I don't know that there is. I, I think, you know, I I kind of liken cannabis legalization to gay marriage. It's like, you know, it just took the legislators longer to catch up. I, you know, I remember kind of getting to the point that my, you know, mother-in-law who was a pretty sheltered person you know was like who cares if people get married you know what I mean like you know and my husband was so proud of her he was like oh my gosh my mom like you know has a fourth grade education her parents were immigrants like you know she wasn't like a super progressive you know kind of woman and her world was very small but like you know I remember in the later years of her life she was like why does anybody care who somebody else marries mind your own business you know and I think we got to the point where people in the country like had way moved past that issue and it just the legislators weren't sure it was okay to say that say it yet you know what i mean and finally you know thank goodness the supreme court decision but i think it's the same thing i think the american consumer base you know populace whether or not they ever want to smoke pot or take edibles or you know use cbd or any of this stuff i think they're past it for the most part i really do and i think it's just legislators haven't caught up it's an interesting take. I would agree with you. The older women in my life, the devout Catholics who you would think would never bend, have asked me to come and pre- do a presentation to all their friends on how CBD is good for them. Yeah, but I mean, like, my mom is 82, and like, she's telling me, like, oh, I went to this woman's group. You know, she lives in like rural Canada, you know, and, and she never was like, used anything of any kind she's like oh yeah you know i mean they all smoke pot and they grow it in their yard and they're allowed to grow their own plants and so i tried it you know i mean it's just like i was like oh mom sweet you know but uh, you know i just i think even people who don't want access for their own personal selves just have come to the point where they're like why is this such a big deal anymore you know i mean 
I don't know. I mean, I'm the mom that sat my kids down after they came home from the fifth drink, drug talk and said, let me sit you down and tell you what I think. And, you know, and, and again, it, and it wasn't based on my own personal use. I was like, not all drugs are the same. And frankly, I think alcohol is a lot more dangerous than marijuana, guys. Like, you know, I want you to be smart with whatever you do. But like, I just think, but I do think sometimes legislators are afraid to be the first one. And then once they do, it's the dominoes. You know what I mean? So I, I think we're going to get there sooner rather than later. And I think it's my sort of, you know, guess is that it's going to be like gay marriage where like everyone figures out nobody cares and finally someone has the guts to do it and then the whole thing topples, you know, or it goes to the Supreme Court or whatever. But I think we're going to get there and it's going to be suddenly very quick. Um, and we're seeing those first dominoes off, you know, obviously state after state is starting to legalize. And I think then we're going to get to kind of like a tipping point where it's done. But I mean, so I don't, I think that's going to just from a perception standpoint, I think that's going to make a huge difference for hemp as well. But I, and maybe that will create the political pressure that the FDA, need, the FDA needs to take action on CBD. But right now it's just, it is a, is it a law that has nothing to do with drugs that's holding back the FDA. So we still need that to happen in order to move this piece of the industry forward. What are you excited about in 2022? Oh my gosh. Hopefully for this pandemic to end, right? Um, <laughs> so I can you know, I'm, I I feel like, I mean, if you look at some of the legislation, you know, that we're backing with the USM Brown table and, you know, our company, obviously, um, as well, you know, H.R. 841, the, the, the House legislation to get the FDA to act, I think has 39 co-sponsors as of today. It's, I want to say it's like 26 Democrats and 14 Republicans. This is relatively bipartisan. You know, we pick up people all the time. So I think that, you know, boy, I mean, I we say this every year, right? Like this year is the year that the FDA is finally going to move. I mean, I'm very, very hopeful that this year is the year that the FDA is finally going to move. I mean, we absolutely just need to get this. So I am excited to see that happen because I think, again, that's going to open up just an industry that like we haven't seen. I think it's going to result in a lot of the bad actors in our industry no longer existing because they won't be able to cut it when it's not this wild west of an industry. You know, right now, you know, my big gripe as a marketer who's in charge of labels for a company that's very, very focused on regulatory compliance, I mean, we hold ourselves to an extremely high standard and it hurts us, you know, from a business standpoint. I mean, you know, I'm competing with my perfect labels that have 700 things and warnings and all this because every state requires something different. So my labels look confusing and terrifying. And, you know, we actually make products that are broad spectrum. So no detectable levels of THC, but I still have to have like THC warnings on my labels, you know, because certain states just require me to say whether or not I have THC in my product, you know, so we've just, we've got, when you're trying to comply with the laws as our company does, you end up with a a label, a product label that is really confusing, has tiny words, and frankly has just a lot of warnings on it that we don't think are necessary but are required by law. And, you know, if I'm now competing with the many, many companies who really don't care if their labels are compliant, you know, if I was just a regular consumer, you know, we know consumers are drawn to clean, simple labels. I mean, we we in the industry tell people, look for non-confusing, look for not big words, you know, so... And now I've got, you know, Joe's CBD made in a bathtub that's like, for your pain, you know, or you know, cures, whatever. And I'm like, I, I can never say that. And I have all this crazy stuff on my label. And so I think the lack of this FDA action, the unintended consequence of that is we're actually allowing more products out there that aren't compliant in terms of labeling. And I was kind of looking to think, if you don't care or you don't know how to have a compliant label, does that mean you don't care or don't know how to manufacture things safely? That's my concern is, you know, they either don't know or they don't care. And I'm not sure which one is worse, but your label often is reflective of how you run your whole business. And so my concern is what's in that bottle? Do you know, is it safe? Has it been tested? You know, does it have what it says? Is it dangerous? I mean, making supplements is a business where you have to be very, very, very cautious. I mean, you have to, you you do have to be careful and manufacture things in a way that doesn't potentially create harm and and this kind of wild west that we are stuck in for the last several years means that we have a lot of companies that are allowed to thrive in this environment. They won't cut it nearly as easily once this is a larger industry. They just won't be able to. It'll be much easier and cleaner for all of us to talk about, 
you know, safety and requirements and what should be in there and what shouldn't be in there. And larger retailers are much more, often much more careful about vetting things than, you know, sometimes smaller stores or a convenience store or whatever. So, you know, I just, I think that's a really important piece of this that, that I'm excited for because we are a business that cares about compliance and tries to do everything right. But like I said, from a business standpoint, that actually, unfortunately, I think is, um, harms us from a, a you know, a, a ability to grow standpoint, but we're not going to change how we run our business. That's what we believe we should do. But it does allow us to have competition from people who don't care how they make their products. Yeah. Welcome so. to the California cannabis market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're, I, I understand that all too well. Yeah. It's, it's, it's real. And I, and then this, this is the stuff that, you know, we know in the industry and it's like when you're really close to stuff, you know, all this stuff, but consumers don't know this. Like I said, they're going to go for the label that says, you know, it's going to cure their, their ex, you know, and, and, and of course they do. Like, why wouldn't they, they don't, they don't understand labeling requirements and they shouldn't have to. So that's the kind of stuff that, you know, I kind of, that keeps me up at night <laughs> now, but I'm hoping that to be, you know, going like, hallelujah, now everybody has to follow the same rules that I do. Like, great. You know, cause now it's all about what's in the bottle and does it work and is it quality, right? Before we go, is there anything else you want to share with our audience? Oh gosh. I mean, I will say, I just, you know, I think really there's no industry that I've worked in that's quite like this one. And I, you know, as you said, worked in a number of industries, um, from organic food. I also worked in the building products industry for a long time and a, and a few other places. And this is a really neat industry. And I, and I, you know, maybe it's, all, I'm getting a little mushy here, but I honestly, I have so many major competitors of mine that I adore and love as people and who I know I could call and ask their advice on an issue or ask them what they're doing. And they would actually give me a straight answer. I think it is a very unique industry. I have met so many amazing people in this industry, but I have met so many amazing women in this industry. I mean, you know, again, competitors, you know, colleagues, whatever you want to call them, but like dear, dear friends. And I've never worked in an industry where there is this sort of, I don't know, like a really cool sense of camaraderie and support. Anyway, I just, it's, it's, I feel really fortunate to be working in this industry at this time as a woman. And, you know, as I said, I know that, you know, when I entered it, that you women were a little bit scarce, but I'm just seeing them pouring in from all sides and I'm seeing them taking charge of a lot of things and I'm seeing them leading the way in a lot of places. And it's, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty neat sisterhood that, that we get going here and I'm super thrilled to be part of it. I agree. Completely agree. I think that's very well yeah. said. Where can my listeners find out more about you and the U S hemp round table? Well, the U S hemp round table, you could find it, um, hemp supporter.com. And, you know, I think, again, as an industry organization, a rising tide raises all ships, you know, the more companies we can get in, you know, we have different levels of membership from, you know, member level to board level to executive committee level. But I strongly recommend for people to join that organization. It's a little less so, you know, since we've been, you know, not able to meet in person. But I think the strongest connections I've made in this industry were in, you know, our quarterly board meetings where we all get together. It travels around the country. And again, you know, for anyone who's trying to grow a company, I think that organization just there is a camaraderie that is really critical there. And just as, you know, anybody interested in the industry or help wanting to help kind of push legislation, hempsupporter.com is where you can also go to you know, contact your legislator really easily to figure out what's happening in your state. You know, are there state things that are happening that you should be getting behind and helping to push forward? Like, how can you get involved in moving things forward? That's really the place to go to make that very easy to do. So I, that, yeah, that would be where to go for the, for the, all the round table news. Thank you so much, Ola, for your time and for sharing your journey with us today. Yeah, thank you. And um, can I just put in a plug for where people can go for our products? Absolutely. Yeah. So again, um, we, we, as a company have three brands, Sagely Naturals, which of course is sagelynaturals.com, apothecana.com and hempfusion.com. So we make a variety of different products. Uh, Sagely Naturals is a women's brand uh, founded by two incredible women in this industry. So um, we'd love for folks to, to give us a try and let us know what they think too on that. Ladies, thank you for tuning in. If you haven't yet joined the Women Employed in Cannabis community, go to weicwomen.com. There you'll find all the details on membership for women working in cannabis. WEIC is a community that provides networking, mentoring, and support to women working in cannabis in the U.S., Canada, and around the world where there's an interest in cannabis legalization. 
We welcome women who are currently working in cannabis or curious about taking a leap into the industry. Consider becoming a WEIC woman member or WEIC business member for benefits and access across the network. And join us again for another conversation with women leading in cannabis. Mm -hmm.